Welcome and happy Friday to you. Thanks for joining me in our last day reading through the Royal Book of Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. We will be finishing the last three chapters today. If you remember yesterday's reading, the Scarecrow was not changed back into his original form of an 85-year-old man, and his sons were changed into two pigs and a weasel. The Scarecrow abdicates his throne, gives it to Happy, and is free to go with his friends back to Oz. To try and get back to Oz, Dorothy uses her magic parasol. So let's go ahead and read the last few pages, last few chapters, and see how our friends do get back to Oz and what happens when they do. So this is chapter 22, The Flight of the Parasol. Holding the handle of the parasol, Dorothy steered it with all the skill of an aviator, and in several minutes after their start, the party had entered the deep black passage down which the scarecrow had fallen. Each one of the adventurers was fastened to the par parasol with ropes of different lengths, so that none of them bumped together, but even with all the care in the world, it was not possible to keep them from bumping the sides of the tube. The comfortable camel grunted plaintively from time to time, and Dorothy could hear the doubtful dromedary complaining bitterly in the darkness. It was pitch dark, but by keeping one hand in touch with the bean pole, Dorothy managed to hold the parasol in the center. How long will it take? She called breathlessly to the scarecrow, who was dangling just below. Hours, wheezed the scarecrow, holding fast to his hat. I hope none of the parties on this line hear us, he added nervously, thinking of the middlings. What wrecks it, blustered Sir Hocus. Hast forgotten my trusty sword? But his words were completely drowned in the rattle of his armor. Hush, warned the scarecrow, or we'll be pulled in. So, for almost an hour, they flew up the dark chimney-like tube, with only an occasional groan, as one or another scraped against the rough sides of the passage. Then, before they knew what was happening, the parasol crashed into something, half-closed, and the whole party started to fall, head over heels, over helmets. Oh, gasped Dorothy, turning a complete somersault. Catch hold of the bean pole, somebody! Put up the parasol, shrieked the scarecrow. Just then, Dorothy finding herself right side up, grasped the, bean, the pole herself, and snapped the parasol wide open. Up, up, up they soared, again even faster than ever. We're flying up much faster than I fell down. We must be at the top, called the scarecrow hoarsely, and somebody has closed the opening. Chapter 23. Safe at last in the land of Oz. Must we keep bumping until we bump through? panted Dorothy anxiously. No, by my hilts, roared Sir Hocus, and setting his foot in a notch of the beanstalk, he cut with his sword the rope that bound him to the parasol. Put the parasol down halfway, and I'll climb ahead and cut an opening. With great difficulty, Dorothy partially lowered the parasol, and instantly their speed diminished. Indeed, they barely moved at all, and the knight had soon passed them on his climb to the top. Are you there? rumbled the cowardly lion anxiously. A great clod of earth landed on his head, filling his eyes and mouth with mud. Ugh! roared the lion. It's getting light! It's getting light! screamed Dorothy in her excitement, in, and in her excitement snapped the parasol up. Sir Hocus, having cut with his sword, a large circular hole in the thin crust of earth covering the tube was about to step out when the parasol, hurling up from below, caught him neatly on its top and outburst the whole party and sailed up almost to the clouds. Welcome to Oz, Dorothy cr cried, looking down happily on the dear familiar munchkin landscape. Home at last, exulted the scarecrow, wafting a kiss downward. Let's get down to earth before we knock the sun into a cocked hat, gasped the cowardly lion, for Dorothy, in her excitement, had forgotten to lower the parasol. 
Now the little girl lowered the parasol carefully at first, and then faster and faster, and finally shut it all together. Sir Hocus took a dive from the top, down tumbled the others over and over. But fortunately for all, there was a great haystack below, and upon this they landed in a jumbled heap, close to the magic bean pole. As it happened, there was no one in sight. Up they jumped in a thrice, and while the comfortable camel and the doubtful dromedary munched contentedly at the hay, Sir Hocus and the scarecrow placed some loose boards over the opening around the bean pole and covered them with dirt and corn stalks. I will get Ozma to close it properly with the magic belt, said the scarecrow gravely. It wouldn't do to have people sliding down my family tree and scaring poor Tappy. As for me, I shall never leave Oz again. I hope not, growled the cowardly lion, tenderly examining his scratched hide. But if you hadn't, I'd never have had such lovely adventures, nor found Sir Hocus and the comfortable camel and the doubtful dromedary, said Dorothy. And what a lot I have to tell Ozma. Let's go straight to the Emerald City. It's quite a journey, explained the scarecrow to Sir Hocus, who was cleaning off his armor with a handful of straw. I go where Lady Dot goes, replied the knight, smiling affectionately at the little girl and straightening the ragged hair ribbon which he still wore on his arm. Don't forget me, dear Karwin Bashi, wheezed the comfortable camel, putting his head on the knight's shoulder. You're a sentimental dunce, Cammy. I doubt whether they'll take us at all. The doubtful dromedary looked wistfully at Dorothy. Go to hat now, cried Sir Hocus, putting an arm around each long neck. You're just like two of the family. It will be comfortable to go now, sighed the camel. We're all of a big jolly family here, said the scarecrow, smiling brightly, and Oz is the friendliest country in the world. Right, said the cowardly lion, but let's get started. He stretched his tired muscles and began limping stiffly toward the yellow brick road. Wait, cried Dorothy. Have you forgotten the parasol? I wish I could, groaned the cowardly lion, rolling his eyes. Sir Hocus, with folded arms, was gazing a bit regretfully at the bean pole. It has been a brave quest, he sighed, but now, I take it, our adventures are over. Absently, the knight felt in his boot top, and, drawing out a small red bean, popped it into his mouth. Just before reaching the top of the tube, he had pulled a handful of them from the bean stalk, but the others had fallen out when he dove into the hay. Shall we use the parasol again, Lady Dot? he asked, staring pensively at the bean pole. Shall... he got no further, nor did Dorothy answer his question. Instead, she gave a loud scream and clutched the scarecrow's arm. The scarecrow, taken by surprise, fell over backward, and the comfortable camel, raising his head inquiringly, gave a bellow of terror. From the knight's shoulders, a green branch had sprung, and while the company gazed in round-eyed astonishment, it stretched towards the bean pole, attached itself firmly, and then shot straight into the air, the knight kicking and struggling on the other end. In another second, he was out of sight. Come back! Come back! screamed the comfortable camel, running around distractedly. I doubt we'll ever see him again, groaned the droughtful dromedary, craning his neck upward. Do something! Do something! begged Dorothy, at which the scarecrow jumped up and dashed toward the little farmhouse. I'll get an axe, he called over his shoulder, and chopped down the bean pole. No, don't do that, roared the cowardly lion, starting after him. Do you want to break him to pieces? Oh, oh, can you think of nothing else? cried Dorothy. And hurry, or he'll be up to the moon. The scarecrow put, bo door put both hands to his head and stared around wildly. Then, with a triumphant wave of his hat, declared himself ready to act. The parasol, cried the late emperor of Silver Island. Quick, Dorothy, 
put up the parasol. Snatching the parasol, which lay at the foot of the bean pole, Dorothy snapped it open, and the scarecrow just had time to make a flying leap and seize the handle before it soared upward, and in a trice, they too had disappeared. Dowdy, Dowdy, wailed the comfortable camel, crowding up to his humpbacked friend. We're having a pack of trouble. My knees are all a-tremble. Now don't you worry, advised the cowardly lion, sitting down resignedly. I'm frightened myself, but that's because I'm so cowardly. Queer things happen in Oz, but they usually turn out all right. Why, Sir Hocus is just growing up with the country, that's all. Just growing up with the country. Doubt that, sniffed the doubtful dromedary faintly. He was grown up in the beginning. But think of the scarecrow's brains. You leave things to the scarecrow's brains, said the cowardly lion. But it was no use. Both beasts began to roar dismally. I don't want a plant. I want my Carwin Bashi, sobbed the comfortable camel, broken-heartedly. Well, don't drown me, begged the cowardly lion, moving out of the way of the camel's tears. Say, what's that draft? What indeed? The trees overhead. In the trees overhead, a very cyclone whistled, and before the three had even time to catch their breath, they were blown high into the air and the next instant were hurtling toward the Emerald City like three furry cannonballs, faster and faster. Chapter 24 Homeward Bound to the Emerald City Dorothy and the Scarecrow, clinging fast to the magic parasol, had followed the night almost to the clouds. At first, it looked as if they would never catch up with him, so swiftly was the branch growing. But it was not long before the little umbrella began to gain, and in several minutes more they were beside Sir Hocus himself. Beshrew me now, gasped the knight, stretching out his hand toward Dorothy. Canst stop this reckless plant? Give me your sword, commanded the scarecrow, and I'll cut you off. Dorothy, with great difficulty, kept the parasol close to the knight, while the scarecrow reached for the sword. But Sir Hocus backed away in alarm. "'Tis part of me, and if you cut it off, I will be cut off too. "'Tis rooted in my back,' he puffed. "'What shall we do?' cried Dorothy in distress. "'Maybe if we take hold of his hands, we can keep him from going any higher.' The scarecrow jammed down his hat so it wouldn't blow off, nodded approvingly, and, each holding the parasol with one hand, gave the other to the knight. And when Dorothy pointed the parasol down, to her great delight, Sir Hocus came also, the thin green branch growing just about as fast as they moved. Just then, the little fan, which had been rolling around merrily in Dorothy's pocket, slipped out and fell straight downward toward the three unsuspecting beasts below. Draft, no wonder, but Dorothy never missed it, and quite unconscious of such a calamity, anxiously talked over the knight's predicament with the scarecrow. They both decided that the best plan was to fly straight to the Emerald City and have Ozma release the knight from the enchanted beanstalk. I'm sorry you got tangled up in my family tree, old fellow, said the scarecrow, after they had flown some time in silence. But this makes us relations, doesn't it? He winked broadly at the knight. So it does, said Sir Hocus jovially. I'm a branch of your family tree now. Methinks I should not have swallowed that bean. Bean? questioned Dorothy. What bean? The knight carefully explained how he had plucked a handful of red beans from the beanstalk just before reaching the top of the tube, and how he had eaten one. So that's why you started growing! exclaimed Dorothy in surprise. Alas, yes, admitted the knight. I've never felt more grown up in my life, he finished solemnly. An adventurous country, this Oz. I should say it was, chuckled the scarecrow. But isn't it almost time we were reaching the Emerald City, Dorothy? I think I'm going the right direction, answered the little girl. 
but I'll fly a little lower, to be sure. Not too fast, not too fast, warned Sir Hocus, looking nervously over his shoulder at his long, wriggling stem. There's Ozma's palace, cried the scarecrow all at once. And there's Ozma, screamed Dorothy, peering down delightedly. And Scraps and Tick-Tock and everybody. She pointed the parasol straight down when a sharp tug from Sir Hocus jerked them back. They were going faster than the poor knight was growing. So Dorothy lowered the parasol halfway and slowly they floated toward the earth, landing gently in one of the flower beds of Ozma's lovely garden. Come along and meet the folks, said the scarecrow as Dorothy closed the parasol. But Sir Hocus clutched him in an arm. Hold, hold, gasped the knight. I've stopped growing, but if you leave me, I'll shoot up into the air again. The scarecrow and Dorothy looked at each other in dismay. Surely enough, the knight had stopped growing, and it was all they could do to hold him down to the earth, for the stubborn branch of Beanstalk was trying to straighten up. They had fallen quite a distance from the palace itself, and all the people of Oz had their backs turned, so had not seen their singular arrival. Hello, called the scarecrow loudly. Then, help, help, as the knight jerked him twice into the air. But Ozma, Trot, Jack Pumpkinhead, and all the rest were staring upward and talking so busily amongst themselves that they did not hear either Dorothy's or the scarecrow's cries. First one, then the other was snatched off his feet, and although Sir Hocus, with tears in his eyes, begged them to leave him to his fate, they held on with all their might, just as if it looked, just as it looked as if they would all three fly into the air again. The little Wizard of Oz happened to turn around. Look, look! He cried, tugging Ozma's sleeve. Why, it's Dorothy! Gasped Ozma rubbing her eyes. It's Dorothy and... Help! Help! screamed the scarecrow, waving one arm wildly. Without waiting another second, all the celebrities of Oz came running toward the three adventurers. Somebody heavy, come take a hold! puffed Dorothy, out of breath with her efforts to keep Sir Hocus on the ground. The Ozites, seeing that help was needed at once, suppressed their curiosity I'm heavy, said Tick-Tock solemnly, grasping the knight's arm. The tin woodman seized his other hand, and Dorothy sank down, exhausted, on the grass. Princess Ozma pressed forward. What does it all mean? Where did you come from? asked the little Queen of Oz, staring in amazement at the strange spectacle before her. And who is this medieval person? asked Professor, Wog Professor Wogglebug pushing forward importantly. He had returned to the palace to collect more data for the Royal Book of Oz. He doesn't look evil to me, giggled Scraps, dancing up to Sir Hocus, her suspender button eyes snapping with fun. He isn't, said Dorothy indignantly, for Sir Hocus was too shaken about to answer. He's my knight errant. Ah, I see, replied Professor Wogglebug, a case of when knighthood was in flower. And would you believe it? The beanstalk at that minute burst into a perfect shower of red blossoms that came tumbling down over everyone. Before they had recovered from their surprise, the branch snapped off close to the knight's armor, and Tick-Tock, the Tin Woodman, and Sir Hocus rolled over in a heap. The branch itself whistled through the air and disappeared. Oh, cried Dorothy, hugging the knight impulsively. I'm so glad. Are you all right? asked the scarecrow anxiously. Good as ever, announced Sir Hocus. And indeed, all traces of the magic stock had disappeared from his shoulders. Dorothy, cried Ozma again. What does it all mean? Merely that I slid down my family tree and that Dorothy and this knight rescued me, said the scarecrow calmly. And he's a real royalty, so there, cried Dorothy with a wave at the scarecrow and making a little face at Professor Wogglebug. Meet his Supreme Highness, Chang Wang Wo of Silver Island, who has abdicated his throne 
and returned to be a plain scarecrow in Oz. Then, as the eminent educator of Oz stood gaping at the scarecrow, Oh, Ozma, I've so much to tell you. Begin, begin, cried the little wizard, for everything's mighty mysterious. First, the cowardly lion and two unknown beasts shoot through the air and stop just outside the third story windows, and there they hang, although I've tried all my magic to get them down. Then you and the scarecrow drop in with a strange knight. Oh, the poor cowardly lion, gasped Dorothy as the wizard finished speaking. The magic fan, she felt hurriedly in her pocket. It's gone. It must have slipped out of your pocket and blown them here, and they'll never come down till that fan is closed, cried the scarecrow in an agitated voice. All of this was Greek to Ozma and the others, but when Dorothy begged the little queen to send for her magic belt, she did it without question. This belt Dorothy had captured from the Gnome King, and it enabled the wearer to wish people and objects wherever one wanted them. I wish the magic fan to close and to come safely back to me, said Dorothy, as soon as she had clasped the belt around her waist. No sooner were the words out before there was a loud crash and a series of roars and groans. Everybody started on a run for the palace, Sir Hocus ahead of the rest. The fan had mysteriously returned to Dorothy's pocket. The three animals had fallen into a huge cluster of rose bushes and, though badly scratched and frightened, were really unhurt. I doubt that I'll like Oz, quavered the doubtful dromedary, lurching towards Sir Hocus. You might have been more careful with that fan, growled the cow cowardly lion, reproachfully plucking thorns from his side. The comfortable camel was so overjoyed to see the knight that he rested his head on Sir Hocus's shoulder and began weeping down his armor. And now that their adventures seemed really over, what explanations were to be made? Sitting on the top step of the palace, with all of them around her, Dorothy told the whole wonderful story of the Scarecrow's family tree. When her breath gave out, the Scarecrow took up the tale himself, and as they all realized how nearly they had lost their jolly comrade, many of the party shed real tears. Indeed, Nick Chopper hugged the Scarecrow till there was not a whole straw in his body. Never leave us again, begged Ozma, and the Scarecrow, crossing Nick Chopper's heart, he had none of his own, promised that he never would. And what a welcome they gave to Sir Hocus, the doubtful dromedary, and the comfortable camel. Altogether, it was delightful. Only Professor Wogglebug seemed disturbed. During the strange recital, he had gone, grown quieter and quieter, and finally, with an embarrassed cough, had excused himself and hurried into the palace. He went directly to the study, and seating himself at a desk, opened a large book, none other than the Royal Book of Oz. Dipping an emerald pen in the ink, he began a new chapter, headed thus. His Imperial Majesty, the Scarecrow, late Emperor of the Imperial Sovereign of Silver Island. Then, flipping over several pages to a chapter headed Princess Dorothy, he wrote carefully at the end, Dorothy, Princess and Royal Discoverer of Oz. Meanwhile, below the stairs, the Scarecrow was distributing his gifts. There were silver chains for everyone in the palace, and shining silver slippers for Ozma, Betsy Bobbin, Trot, and Dorothy, and a bottle of silver polish for Nick Chopper. Dorothy presented Ozma with the magic fan and parasol, and they were safely put away by Jellia Jam with the other magic treasures of Oz. Next, because they were all curious to see the Scarecrow's wonderful kingdom, they hurried upstairs to look in the magic picture. Show us the Emperor of the Silver Island, commanded Ozma. Immediately, the beautiful silver throne appeared. Happy Toko had removed his imperial hat and was standing on his head, to the great delight of all the court. And a host of little Silver Islander boys were peeking in at the windows. 
Now doesn't that look cheerful? asked the scarecrow delightedly. I knew he'd make a good emperor. I wish we would hear what he was saying, said Dorothy. Oh, do look at Choo Choo. The grand Choo Choo was standing beside the throne, scowling horribly. I think I can arrange for you to hear, muttered the Wizard of Oz. And taking a queer magic instrument from his pocket, he whispered, aho ye be bo ye bye Instantly, they heard the jolly voice of Happy Toko singing, Oh, shiny silver shoes, and brush his silver cue, for I am but an emperor, and he's the grand choo-choo. Ozma laughed heartily as the picture faded away, and so did the others. Indeed, there was so much to ask and wonder about that it seemed as if they would never finish talking. Let's have a party, an old-fashioned Oz party, proposed Ozma, when the excitement had calmed down a bit. And an old-fashioned party it was, with places for everybody and a special table for the cowardly lion, the hungry tiger, Toto, the glass cat, the comfortable camel, the doubtful dromedary, and all the other dear creatures of that amazing kingdom. Sir Hocus insisted upon stirring up a huge pasty for the occasion, and there were songs, speeches, and cheers for everyone, not forgetting the doubtful dromedary. And at the cheering, he rose with an embarrassed jerk of his long neck. In my left saddle sack, he said gruffly, there's a quantity of silken shawls and jewels. I doubt whether they are good enough, but I would like Dorothy and Queen Ozma to have them. Here, here, cried the scarecrow, pounding on the table with a knife. Then everything grew quiet as Ozma told how she, with the help of Glenda the Good Sorceress, had stopped the war between the Horners and Hoppers. When she had finished, Sir Hogus sprang up impulsively. I prithee, lovely lady, never trouble your royal head about wars again. From now on, I will do battle for you and little Dorothy and Oz, and I will be your good knight every day. At this, the applause was tremendous. Ye good knight of Oz, full of good courage and vim, will do battle for us and we'll take care of him, shouted Scraps, who was becoming more excited every minute. I'll lend you some of my polish for your armor, old fellow, said Nick Chopper, as the knight sat down, beaming with pleasure. Well, said Ozma with a smile, when everyone had feasted and talked to heart's content. Is everybody happy? I am, cried the comfortable camel, for here I am perfectly comfortable. I am, cried Dorothy, putting her arm around the scarecrow, who sat next to her, for I have found my old friend and made some new ones. I'm happy, cried the scarecrow, waving his glass, because there is no age in Oz, and I am still my old Ozish self. As for me, said the knight, I am happy, for I have served a lady, gone on a quest, and slain a dragon. Ozma and Oz forever. The end. I do hope you enjoyed this book. I enjoyed sharing it with you. On Monday, we are going to start our 16th book in the Oz series, series uh, Kabumpo in Oz. So I hope you'll join me then on Monday for our next book. I hope that you have a wonderful weekend.